welcome to Broken Entertainment. I uh, hope everyone had a good Thanksgiving over in the United, over here in the United States. Um, but let's go ahead and get back into our routine, shall we? So there's this article on Wired, and I'm not a big fan of Wired. I don't like basically anything they do most of the time. But they did have this article that I found interesting. It's talking about. Uh, how in entertainment, specifically Hollywood, it seems like every villain now has an origin story, right? And this is pretty new. Now, a lot of villains have had origin stories in the past. If you think of classic villains uh, like Darth Vader, for example, uh, in the original series of movies, he did, in fact, have an origin story. You don't hear much about it, and you don't really know a lot of details or how exactly it played out, but you know that at one point, um, he was a good guy. And initially, you don't even know that. You know that at one point, uh, Anakin Skywalker gets killed by Darth Vader. But you, when you learn the truth, it's still kind of vague. And the vagueness works fine. You don't need to know everything about him. You don't need to even really know why he falls to the dark side, only that he does um, out of fear, essentially. And... You also have a lot of classic villains that have no backstory. Not really, not an origin story anyway. Uh, the Joker originally, um, for example. I don't think Lex Luthor had one, I could be wrong. You know, th just to name a few, um, this uses a specific example from Home Alone. There's no origin story for Gozer and the Ghostbusters. And it works, fine. You know, so the question is, do we need origin stories on villains? And more to the point, do we need origin stories for characters in general? Now, heroes, probably, because they're kind of your main character. you got to at least have some idea of where they're coming from. Um, but I think that's even really kind of open for debate when you think about some of the characters that are out there that are heroes where you don't start at the beginning of their journey, so to speak. And... You don't necessarily have to know everything about them then either. But let's go ahead and get into this. I'm not going to read through the whole thing, um, but I do think it makes some really good points before it goes off the uh, capitalism bad trope that the Wired likes to do. But In 1999 Christmas classic Home Alone, a young boy fights off the wet bandits, a duo of cartoonish burglars motivated by a little more than greed and a desire to say the movie's name in a sinister voice while flashing a gold tooth. Three decades later, Home Sweet Home Alone, a rebooted version of the story streaming on Disney+, Plus, sees a young boy fight off a pair of burglars, struggling parents Pam and Jeff McKenzie, who simply want to take back a priceless doll that was stolen from them so they're not financially ruined and forced to sell their family home. What? <laughs> okay. I barely knew Home Sweet Home Alone was a thing. And uh, everything I've seen on it is like, do not touch, do not pass go, do not collect $200, do not go anywhere within 10 feet of this movie. And uh, I can see why, just from that description. Um, one of the reasons the burglars work so well in the first movie is they're they're just burglars. They're They're... The pretty straightforward bad guy, right? And here, are you supposed to root against parents trying to save their family? That's kind of weird. And it kind of paints the good guy to look like a bad guy. Um, yeah, it's just that's just weird. Uh, it's unclear exactly why Home Sweet Home Alone writers decided that a thief can no longer simply be a thief, but they are following a precedent firmly established in the last few years. Last summer, audiences learned that a puppy murderer can no longer just be a puppy murderer when Disney's Cruella revealed that the infamous 101 Dalmatians villain had a difficult history with the dogs. Netflix's 2020 series Ratcheted sim similarly explores the origins of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest Bitter Twisted Antagonist Nurse Ratchet, portraying her as a victim of child abuse. Uh, there's, there's a string here that I'm going to pull on in a minute, but let's keep going. Where will this trend end? Infinity and Beyond Toy Story prequel Lightyear is set to drop next summer. The animated movie follows human astronaut Buzz Lightyear, meaning a toy can no longer simply be a toy, 
everybody, be they made of plastic or draped in animal skin, now needs complicated, emotional, psychologically scarring backstory, whether it's print, presented in a feature-length origin story, a prequel, or a labor plotline of a reboot, it's best at best confusing, and at worst, and I would argue most commonly, cheap. And that's why it's done. It's a cheap, easy way to try to squeeze some more money out of a franchise. You know, okay, you like this movie? Well, well, let we got a whole story to tell you about about why this person was the villain in that movie, so that you'll go watch this movie, and we'll make some more money off of it while we're waiting to make the sequel, and then we're gonna make a prequel to the sequel that follows the. Uh, this is classic corporatist media. You know, they're they're just making stuff to make money at this point. There's no artistic effort in it whatsoever there's no integrity behind it it's just make money make money make money make money and i have no problem with a company wanting to make money but when you're making entertainment you got to do a little bit more than just make money you got to tell a story you got to entertain and a lot of these aren't and you can see that in their ratings you can see that in how they end up performing um and especially if you compare opening week to the following week, it's usually a gigantic drop off of a cliff, and then nobody goes and sees the movie. And then they blame it on COVID and watch one rinse repeat. It's obvious why studios make prequels and spinoffs. They're an easy way to cash in on popular intellectual property and tap into existing fan bases. Although I instinctually roll my eyes at Lightyear, I also know I'll probably go and see it. And there, right there, is the problem from the perspective of customers. If you don't like the concept if you think it's dumb don't go watch it and a lot of people do they're, they're like oh, why are we getting so many sequels and spinoffs oh a spinoff to that movie oh i'm gonna go see that and then they keep making them it's it's a circle right and this writer points that out perfectly by saying they're gonna go see this movie that they just rolled their eyes at why it's hard to resist the next or previous chapter in a beloved franchise that's almost 30 years old. Not really. If that chapter looks dumb or unnecessary, it's pretty easy to miss. You got a lot of memories. You got some great stories. You can go back and rewatch. Why do you want to go waste your time on something you know going in you don't like the idea of? But so many people do this, right? And we see that now with Marvel, where people go, well, it's a Marvel movie, i got to go see it. Have you seen the latest Marvel movie? Oh, I, I heard it was like this. I'm going to go see it. And then they see it, and they're like, eh, it was okay, I guess. I'm kind of tired of superhero movies, really. And the next Marvel movie comes out. Oh, a Marvel movie, i got to go see that. Have you seen the latest Marvel movie? You know, so this is a problem uh, that it's difficult to wake up a fan base, right? It's difficult to wake up the average customer because they just want to be entertained they, they they're thinking i like marvel movies avengers was really good i liked Endgame. i need to go see this next one because it'll be entertaining it'll give me a break from life and then they go and they see it and they're like okay that didn't work out but the next one you know it's marvel right <laughs> and in the case of these other ones that we're, we're talking about disney oh well you know um, Maleficent wasn't very good, but that'll probably be different with this next one, because it's Disney. No, it's not going to be different. Spoiler alert. <laughs> but it is hard, and it takes time, it takes repeated bombs at the box office, but eventually people wake up and they're like, man, why am I seeing, why, and especially as prices go up, you're going to see it more and more. People going, why am I going to go see this? Why go see this movie? Why pay that kind of money to go see it? An obsession with backstories means that everywhere you look, writers are adding depth to characters who really, really don't need depth. When watching Home, Home Sweet Home Alone, are we supposed to cheer when a desperate mother turned burglar has her feet lit on fire and lies down at her feet sobbing in the snow? Not. It goes beyond that. Are you supposed to accept the person who was a villain in 101 Dalmatians because she wanted to skin 101 puppies and make coats out of them. Are you supposed to root for that person because 
that somebody was mean to them in the past and two dogs were involved in killing their mom. That's not a human response. And it's not the kind of thing that people go, oh yeah, I can totally understand. Just like in Home Sweet Home Alone, based off of these descriptions, you're not going to root for the good guy. You're going to root for the villains. So what are they accomplishing? What is that additional backstory really gaining you when it's actually damaging the story you're trying to tell? Believe it or not, way back in 2009, Den of Geek published an article asking whether it was time to lose the obsession with prequels and origin stories. This prescient 12-year-old tome starkly reveals just how long we've been in the clutches of big backstory. It goes farther back than that, but okay. Led to Hannibal Rising and Underworld 3 and Sleeping Beauty's prequel, Maleficent. I'm kind of skimming here. Uh, now we're going to get the Rise of Gru. We got Joker, which I would argue not really an origin story in particular. It was more of a one-off initially. Uh, you know, it's an origin of a possible Joker. It's not really this is the origin of the Joker, right? But I understand where they're coming from. So here's kind of the thing. We have all this going on, and it's damaging stories in a lot of ways, and in other ways just telling unnecessary stuff. Does every villain need a backstory? That's, that's the heart of the question. Does every villain need a backstory? I would argue no. Um, and you can point to some pretty classic villains. Sauron comes to mind. I'm aware he has a backstory in the Silmarillion, but that doesn't count in just the Lord of the Rings novels where he's introduced, nor does it count in the movies and the Silmarillion was never really it wasn't like Tolkien sat there and said I'm gonna make an origin story of Sauron he had written all this stuff and Sauron has an origin story it's just never really there in the story for Lord of the Rings because it doesn't matter and so there's two kind of two ways of going about this you can have villains with no origin story no backstory really um, other than their appearance within the, the context of the media they're in, or um, it can exist, but it's known to the writer, and it's just one of those things that never comes up on screen or text or what have you, because it's not necessary for the story you're telling. Is it then necessary to go in and delve into their backstory and tell their story, and how did this come to be, and why are they the way they are? No, it's not. It's not inherently wrong either. So when is it wrong and when is it right? When do you need that story? Well, if you're trying to tell something very complicated, a very complicated character, it's like, you know, they ended up here because of these things that happened to them. Um, then, yeah, you might need to tell that story. If you need to tell that story, then maybe you should start writing about the villain and then make a story from the perspective of the hero so that that villain is fully contextualized. Otherwise, tidbits, little bits of information can be sprinkled in uh, if you want. But, I mean, look at how well the Joker works. And most of the time, you get a cursory origin story or you get nothing at all. You know, uh, let's take Batman 1989 as an example. Do you get his origin story? Yes. Does it matter? Eh. Is it deep? No. Um, he's already basically crazy, and then he goes crazier. It's more of like just how he got to be the Joker rather than how he got to be crazy, right? But not every villain needs it. Not every villain needs this in-depth, detailed approach. Not every villain needs their own movie, Disney. And the real problem with what Disney's doing, and they don't hit on this, it's not just that not every villain needs an origin story. Not every villain needs an origin story, and your origin story doesn't need to make the villain acceptable. <laughs> the villain is the villain, okay? When there's, there are multiple points in the story I'm writing where you're going to be reading this character as the protagonist, but there are going to be points where you go, oh, right, that's not a good person, <laughs> Okay? We don't get that with, in particular, Disney. You're supposed to feel sorry for Cruella. 
I don't feel sorry for Cruella. She wants to skin dogs. You're supposed to feel sorry for Maleficent. I don't feel sorry for Maleficent. Sorry. And if you look deep enough, Disney's doing this with a specific gender of character, a specific gender of villain where, oh, it's not really their fault. It's society. It's, it's a man. It's what have you. And they're also trying to cash in on that cheap money. So you have different ways in which these origin stories can be damaging. They can be damaging because they undermine the value of the character, which is what you see with Disney. Cruella is no longer a good villain if you sympathize with her. Okay, She's supposed to be the least sympathetic person you can possibly imagine. Villains in general, you're not supposed to sympathize with the villain. You can empathize with the villain. It's different. Where you say, you know, I understand why this person feels the way they do, but they're still wrong, this is still bad, they're still the bad guy. But you're not supposed to look at them like you do a hero and go, oh, well, wow, they're, everything that's happened isn't their fault, it's this person's fault. Well, now you're telling the story of a hero. And the other way it damages it is by just kind of damaging the brand. Like, do you need this story? And that's part of writing a story and writing a novel or writing a movie is you got to sit down and every scene you do, you have to say, do I need this? Does the story need this? The answer is that a lot of times our villains don't need that background. Now, maybe the writer needs it, but the people consuming it don't. The reader, the viewer, what have you, does not need it. Sometimes it's very compelling and interesting, other times it's damaging, and frequently it's just unnecessary. Sauron's backstory, not really not ne ne that necessary. When you learn what it is, it doesn't inform anything on Lord of the Rings really um, that compelling. You know, does knowing Cruella's story make 101 Dalmatians better? No. Does knowing, and I realize that in Toy Story, we're looking at the hero, not the villain. But does knowing where that toy comes from matter? No, it's a freaking toy. It's a space astronaut toy. It's generic. At least it was supposed to be. That was the whole idea, right? Do we need Darth Vader's story? That's an interesting argument. Yes, probably at least the bits that we were given in the original movies. Because then you understand it ties in to Luke's story and what Luke is facing, and, and what Luke has to deal with and overcome. If he were just a faceless villain, it wouldn't really matter, right? Um, do you need Emperor Palpatine's backstory? No. You don't need Emperor Palpatine's origin. You don't get Emperor Palpatine's origin in the first movies, and he works very, very well. There are just some characters, and it's not the kind of thing you can just sit down and explain easily, but there are just some characters that just they just don't need it. But those are the ones that aren't meant to be particularly deep. They're just meant to be interesting or intimidating or a significant problem or what have you. And, and getting these stories is diluting a lot of characters. You know, ask yourself more questions when you think about this. Do you need Yoda's origin? Do you need um Do you need the origin story of the kid in Home Alone? No. Do you need the origin story of Doc Brown in, in Back to the Future? In any more detail than it's given. This is definitely this article hits the nail on the head and that this is a problem. Uh, and that a lot of characters that are getting these backstory treatments don't need it, and they're only getting it because it's an easy cash grab. And why are we getting it? Well, there's two reasons. Disney wants that easy cash grab, and they want to tell you that the female villains were really just misunderstood. Everybody else is doing it because of the cash grab, and also because spinoffs and sequels are kind of getting frustratingly tired from the consumer standpoint. People are like... Okay, Saw 15, I guess I'll go watch it. You know, 
So they, they try to do backstory, they try to do some origins of characters that they hadn't really looked at in depth in the original movie they appeared in. And I'll give you another example, actually. This is a 40K example. Horus. Originally, what did we know about Horus? He got jealous of the Emperor, turned to chaos, tried to overthrow the Imperium. What do we get in the Horus Heresy novels? The whole, like, two or three novel story of how Horus falls to chaos. And, and you know what? It's kind of crap. Like, I'm sorry. If you like that book, that's fine. But, but to me, it was not good. I actually lost a great deal of interest and respect in the character. Because he went from, okay, he got jealous. He wanted to rule. Okay, it's your God Lucifer story of kind of where it came from originally to, oh, he's a whiny crybaby. He didn't get exactly what he wanted, just everything else. He knew he was being trapped by chaos and he went with it anyway because he felt like a whiny little baby. That's what I got out of that story. <laughs> so I just, you have to be careful because you can strip away a lot of the interest in the character by doing that. And I didn't need to know all the details about Horus, and I regret reading them. Just some thoughts. Uh, let me know what you think. Do characters need origin stories? Do villains in particular, should they have origins? How do you feel about these? Uh, if you think I'm completely wrong on the Horus Heresy novels uh, about Horus, please let me know that as well in the comments down below. If you liked the video, please hit the like button. If you haven't subscribed, please consider subscribing. Hit the bell for notifications, and I will see you next time.